I call this sermon Red Pill. It's from Revelation 21, 1 through 4. Revelation 21, 1 through 4. When you find your place in the Holy Word, please stand in reverence of the reading of God's Holy Word, the most important part of the service. Revelation 21, 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea, the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be His people and God Himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have now passed away. Father in heaven, glory to your name. Thank you for the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. As we gather to get today, open our hearts to your truth and fill us with hope. Fill us with the hope that transcends this, this world, Lord. Help us to see the false hopes around us and draw us closer to you. May your spirit move among us today. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. There's nothing in this world worse than losing hope. Even a journey towards death takes on whole new meaning and new purpose if it is accompanied by hope. But the flip side of that is this. Even if life is going wonderfully, even if you have no needs to speak of, if you are without hope, life will seem listless. It will seem excessively long. And even at times, it will feel like a burden. As Dostoevsky reminds us, quote, hope is the most important thing in life. It is a simple matter of survival, unquote. Hope is that energy that pulls us from one moment into the next moment. Hope makes us, makes us relax in our easy chair in the evening. And hope makes us lift up arms against our oppressors. With hope, a man can land on the moon or he can become a saint. But in the absence of hope, even a soul as bold as a lion will crumble like dust. There are different kinds of hope, unfortunately. There's the hope that flutters around like a leaf in the wind, groundless and disappointing. It's the kind of hope that, well, it's the kind of hope that Neo faced when he asked the question, what is the Matrix? Just as Neo sought to understand his reality, we too must recognize that worldly hopes are but shadows. They are deceptive and they are fleeting. Like the poor soul, that we've all seen in the gas station cheering at the top of their lungs that they just won 50 bucks after scratching $300 worth of tickets. So is the frail and worthless hope that sinners cling to before the day of judgment. It is a hollow hope, one that blinds them to the reality of their situations and offers no refuge when the storms of life come crashing down on their heads. Dostoevsky profoundly stated, man is what he believes, unquote. In contrast, biblical hope is a sure foundation, solid, unshakable, and anchored in the promises of God the Eternal. How many of us have been there clinging to something that seemed like it would give us peace or security, only to find out it was a sorry mirage the whole time? Have we looked to the world's promises? We haven't, have we? Have we looked to the world's promises hoping they would fill the emptiness in our souls? Well, just like McDonald's loves to see you smile, so does the education lottery hope you will win. They use powerful words, and they use powerful words in shameful ways that have been a detriment to our country and to our, to our minds. They have been as hollowed out as the word marriage has. You can't win if you don't play, and so the fool wishes and calls it hope. 
In America, we love to see you smile, we love to sell you a dream, and we love to cheer you on as you chase it. But in the end, those dreams are often empty, and the hope they promise is a mirage. It's a hope that feeds on fantasy and leaves you thirsting for something real. The world sells to us false hopes, whether it's wealth, success, happiness through temporary pleasures, what have you. Like the Matrix offers a simulated reality. These worldly hopes create illusions that distract us from the truth. As Morpheus reminds us, quote, there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. We must walk the path of biblical hope or we are lost. In contrast, biblical hope doesn't promise instant gratification, nor does it offer fleeting joy. It promises something far greater, something far more eternal, and something unwavering. As Christians, we are instructed to invest our hope in God and His promises, nothing else. We are informed that worldly things will let us down. The Bible is quite clear. Things will disappoint us, and ultimately it will all fade away. The very things that the world clings to for security and safety are the very things that God warns us to stay away from. First Timothy 6.17 says, quote, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. Unquote. Wealth offers us a false sense of security. It's, 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 it's an illusion. Uh, think back to the pandemic days. A world full of people were told that they were safe if they just followed certain nonsensical rules. And they were told that if they didn't toe the line, it didn't matter how much money they had, they were just as vulnerable as everybody else to plague or starvation you get to choose. An online source says of depression and suicide, studies have shown that suicide rates tend to be higher among affluent individuals compared to those in impoverished communities. Funny, you wouldn't hear, you wouldn't hear that on the news, would you? This may initially seem counterintuitive, but several factors contribute to this trend. Affluent individuals often face intense pressure to maintain their success, their social status, and their lifestyles. This pressure leads them to feelings of isolation, anxiety, and a sense of inadequacy when expectations are not met. Wealth can sometimes create a sense of isolation, as affluent individuals may not feel understood by others or may become detached from meaningful relationships. This disconnection from the family, from friends, and from the community can contribute to feelings of loneliness, and loneliness is a major known risk factor for suicide. For many, affluence comes with a lack of purpose. In a similar way that middle, midlife crises can cause individuals to question their reason for living, this too leads to a sense of insignificance. Watch as the wealthy purchase larger and larger and larger and larger, have you seen some of them, homes to store what? Stuff. They wander aimlessly from one hobby to the next, wishing they would find an everlasting fount of peace in some thing. They have provided for all the needs of the flesh. Those, those problems are no longer with them. But the soul lacks food. It feels itself getting spent on trivialities and foolishness, and it hates it. The soul in its quiet moments, knows that no amount of wealth, no trophy home, no new adventure can fill the growing void that is within. It yearns for something deeper, something eternal, but in the pursuit of material gain, they have forgotten where to look. Like the man who chases after the wind, they run from one fleeting pleasure to the next one, never realizing that what they truly crave cannot be bought, collected, or conquered. The soul created for communion with God withers without purpose, withers without hope. 
And so, while the world may envy their wealth, the truth is that they are often spiritually bankrupt people longing for the peace that comes only from knowing God. How many of us here today have chased the next possession, the next achievement, or the next adventure, thinking it would give us lasting happiness? How often have we believed that just one more thing would do it? Affluence can cause a person to feel stigmatized and make them reluctant to seek help. For many people, the trappings of affluence are nothing more than their attempt to give an outward sign of an inward emptiness. The grand displays of success, cars, homes, vacations, are often nothing but masks hiding the deep, deep, deep dissatisfaction and spiritual thirst gnawing at the soul. They project an image of having it all together, of living the dream, but inside they feel lost, purposeless, and disconnected from the things in life that really do matter. And let's not forget these outward displays of success only further illustrate the hollowness of false hope. This is the great irony of affluence. The more one accumulates, the more they feel the weight of what they cannot purchase. Peace, purpose, and joy. Only when the soul turns back to its creator will it find the lasting hope that it so desperately seeks. So, where does that leave us? The false hopes of affluence and material gain leave us empty and searching for true purpose. The most significant link in the chain of false hope in affluence is the truth that the stuff you give your life to own, owns you. You become your stuff. You are the Jeep guy, or the golf club guy, or the one with the beach house, or the luxury watch collector guy. Your identity becomes entangled with your possessions. Before you know it, you aren't living freely any longer. You're living for the things that you own. The greatest irony is that the stuff you thought would bring peace and happiness begins to dictate your whole life. Instead of being liberated by wealth, you become a prisoner to maintaining the image and the lifestyle. So the question remains to us, if our identity is tied to our possessions, where do we find true freedom? Hmm. And yet, despite all the toys and the trinkets that we can buy, the soul remains restless because deep down inside it, we all know that true peace, true identity, and true purpose cannot be found in stuff. They can only be found in Christ, God. Only when we break free from the chains of materialism and turn back to the Creator can we discover who we truly are and what we are here for. Compared to their impoverished brothers and sisters, they seem to have problems and issues that are not just incapable of being solved by wealth, but are actually created by the presence of wealth in their lives. Impoverished communities in lower income neighborhoods tend to have more robust supportive networks and more vital family units. Don't hear that on the news either, do you? This envelops the person in a blanket of community, in a blanket of purpose, and in a blanket of resilience. In contrast, the true fulfillment found in strong community ties, the emptiness of relying solely on material wealth. People with financial hardship derive a sense of purpose and success in overcoming life's challenges and the inner peace of working for things other than the bloated ego. Isn't it interesting that those who have less often find more peace and contentment? Could it be that the less we expect from this world, the more we expect from the next? It's like going to that movie that was all trailer with no movie. You walk in expecting something grand and wonderful only to discover that all the hype is smoke and mirrors. The affluent often find themselves in a similar situation, living a life that promises fulfillment but leaves them hollow, vacuous inside. Meanwhile, their impoverished brothers and sisters around them, though lacking in material wealth, are wrapped in a blanket of community, purpose, and resilience. They are not weighed down by the constant pursuit of more. 
nor are they plagued by the emptiness that comes with having everything and still feeling nothing. The simplicity of their lives and the strength of their relationships give them a sense of fulfillment that no man tree or luxury car could ever provide them. And here's the kicker. They are happier because they expect less. Life is less about accumulating and more about being for them. More about the joy of small victories and the peace of knowing you've done the best with what you got. The next thing that the Bible tells us that we cannot have hope in is our own power. Psalm 33, 16 to 17 says this, quote, No king, no king, no king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save you, unquote. So let's paraphrase that and let's say you are hopeless. You and the horse you rode in on. <laughs> Relying on human strength, military might, or political power is completely futile. Haven't we learned that now? The Matrix movie teaches us that power is an illusion. As Morpheus states in that, the Matrix is everywhere. It's all around you. But our true strength lies not in this illusion, but in the eternal power of our God. The Bible teaches us that hope does not flow from the halls of Congress, but rather from the river of God. Politicians and kings do not deal in hope, even if their posters say they do. They deal in power. Don't ever be confused about that. They deal in power. And so long as you play along, you will be left powerless and dependent, clinging to the crumbs of false promises and kissing the hand that feeds you. Question the actual structure of the entire edifice and watch as the veneer of hope cracks and crumbles before your very eyes. You will be left out in the cold, a reminder that their promises were never about your well-being, but about maintaining their grip on power. The moment you stop playing by their rules, please folks, stop playing by their rules. The moment you stop playing by their rules, you'll realize that the hope they sold you was nothing more than a tool to control you. The Bible is clear. Hope does not come from the strength of man or the systems that he builds. It flows from the eternal and unshakable source of God, period. Genuine hope cannot be manufactured by politicians paraded in front of cameras or stamped on campaign posters, for crying out loud. It comes from the one who created the heavens and the earth, who holds all things together, not by power, but by love. The list goes on and on and on. Hope cannot be found in idols or false gods. Today, people worship wealth, fame, power, technology, and even their own desires. The list of idols has grown in our day, not dwindled. As it is today, so it was in the days when Jeremiah the weeping prophet says this, do any of the worthless idols of the nations bring rain? Do any of them? Do the skies themselves send down showers? No, it is you, Lord our God. Therefore, our hope is in you, for you are the one who does all this. Not only is the worship of idols empty and shameful, it's a shameful, it's a shameful practice. Not only is it shameful, idols have no power. No power to save, no power to give you wealth, no power to do anything for you. Isaiah 44, 9 through 10 says this, All who make idols are nothing. It's not talking about the idols. All who make idols are nothing, says the holy word of God. And the things they treasure are worthless. Those who would speak up for them are blind. They are ignorant to their own shame. Unquote. I love the Bible. I am astounded at how quickly paganism is infiltrating every single solitary aspect of our lives with nobody standing against it. Stones are being worn for their powers. Crystals are worn for healing as if they could rival the balm of Gilead. People burn sage to cleanse their homes, inviting spirits while claiming to ward them off. 
Tarot cards are shuffled like modern day oracles as though your future could be plucked from the shuffle of cardboard. We've got yoga studios doubling as altars to strange gods and don't even get me started on manifesting your desires. It's all the same old snake oil it's always been, just repackaged for a tech-savvy generation. And yet, as it was in Isaiah's day, so it is today, idols have no power. Their worship only multiplies our emptiness. But make, but make no mistake, these practices aren't harmless. They are spiritual practices. They open doors. Doors that only Christ Himself has the power to shut once they're open. We've just traded golden calves for crystals and wooden idols for the pursuit of the self. The serpent's lie has not changed. You can be like God. And we have only gotten to the third thing that we should not put our hope in. The others include but are not limited to hope and human wisdom. 1 Corinthians 3.19 says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. Human intellect without the light of Jesus Christ is nothing more than blind men drawing maps of the universe all while walking off cliffs. They might sound impressive with their big words and grandiose theories, but without Christ, it's all a house of cards waiting to collapse in the very first gust of truth. The brightest minds of this age fall into the same trap. They trust their logic. Science! How many times do you hear that? They trust in their logic, their science, and their philosophies, but they forget that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. They act like we've ascended to new heights of understanding, yet every new discovery is just another layer of the very thing that they refuse to see. God's fingerprints all over everything. Next on the list is hope in religious rituals and good works. Matthew 7, 22 to 23 informs us that many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Oh my God, it's happening in our age. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I've watched people my entire life give out of their abundance and feel the ego swell with each act of charity as if heaven has a spreadsheet keeping track of donations like a divine tax write-off. They perform their religious duties like they're checking items off a celestial to-do list, thinking that God is somehow impressed by the ritual. Here's the kicker. God doesn't need our rituals at all. He doesn't need our grand gestures, and He doesn't need our good works. He wants us. Our hearts broken and contrite, fully surrendered to Him. You can't earn your way in heaven like you're applying for an exclusive club membership. The Pharisees tried that. How'd it work out? In the end, it's not about what you've done. Fearful saying that. In the end, it's not about what you've done, it's about who you know. And if all you know is the mechanics of religion without the relationship of Christ, you might be surprised when he says, I didn't know you. And unless I want to make this a two-part sermon... I must click through the rest of these. Do not have hope in the false prophets. Jeremiah again says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. We saw that too, didn't we? They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord God Almighty. Unquote. If you don't believe that false prophets still walk the earth, well, then you haven't seen the... Can I name some names? Joel Osteen, Kenneth Copeland, Oprah Winfrey, and nearly all of the new apostolic reformation movement, every last one of them, which masquerades as modern Christianity while, prom while promoting self-appointed apostles and prophets who claim divine authority. These individuals speak more about their own visions and financial gains than they do about the cross of Jesus Christ. Listen to them. They promise wealth, healing, and success as though faith is a giant cosmic vending machine. Insert prayer, receive blessing. 
but this is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. You cannot hope in the temporary pleasures of life. The entire book of Ecclesiastes warns us against that. It says to us that everything is vanity, 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 a dust in the wind. Listen to the tears of the teacher. Listen to the tears of the teacher as he yells out to those who will listen, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. Dawkins claimed, this is Dawkins, we are all just genes trying to get our genes into the next generation. Stripping humanity of its inherent value. You know, the whole world's turned you into nothing but a sex robot. This materialistic perspective robs individuals of the understanding that they are created in the image of God, each with unique worth and purpose in their lives. Hope in mortality and human life is also a dead end. The psalmist lays it bare. He says, people, despite their wealth, do not endure. They are like beasts that perish. This is the fate of those who trust in themselves and of their followers who approve of their sayings, unquote. Trusting in your own strength or even the strength of a friend will eventually cause you to lose hope. Why? Well, because all flesh is weak, fragile, and temporary. We age, we falter, and we fade. Even the wealthiest of us, the strongest and the most powerful among us end up Six feet under, just like everybody else. At best, when your world begins to crumble, you might discover who your true friends are. Those rare few who stick around when there's nothing left to gain from you. But at worst, at worst, you'll discover that a true friend is as rare as water in the desert. People will let you down, whether by betrayal or simply the limits of mortality. Man's strength will fail. But here's the good news. God's strength does not. The psalmist reminds us that the Lord is the strength of His people, a fortress of salvation for His anointed one. When human friendships and strength inevitably crumble, God's promises endure. While the world places its hope in things that perish, those who hope in the Lord will not be put to shame. And finally, the one so many of our citizens need to learn, the one so many of our Christian people need to learn, hmm. the one hope that has destroyed the church and destroyed the country simply because it was hope in the wrong thing. To me, the most insidious, the evilest, and the most powerful of all the idols that we have built in the last few decades that end up disappointing us at every turn is the hope that we have in others. Or more specifically, the hope we have in the approval of others. This isn't just the hope for a passerby's help when our car breaks down. No, this hope is that shameful little beast, that horrid little creature that twists our words, our thoughts, and changes our deeds into whatever we think will make us accepted, liked, or included. This is the hope that sacrifices our convictions on the altar of conformity. John 12, 43 tells us this, For they loved human praise more than praise from God. Unquote. Mothers sought to be like the woke moms on Instagram, sacrificing their values to show their kids how to be inclusive, even if it means accepting things God has called damnable. Fathers felt pressured to affirm whatever the culture said about gender or sexuality, afraid that standing firm in biblical truth would cost them their jobs, their friendships, or even their places in their kids' lives. Teenagers, 
God help them. They were pressured to promote ideologies that directly contradict their Christian upbringing, celebrating pride in the name of love, all to avoid being labeled intolerant. They've been coerced into identifying themselves by their sexuality, their race, or their political stances. How small, instead of finding their identity in God. And the churches, oh, the churches, they've bent the knee. Churches across the country have watered down the gospel, embracing progressive agendas so they don't seem out of touch. Pastors preach social justice over salvation nowadays, and they trade biblical truth for cultural relevance, afraid that standing on the Word of God will empty their pews. Let me remind you, my friends, that the approval of others is a trap. Ayn Rand boldly stated, the question isn't who is going to let me, it's who is going to stop me. Unquote. This mindset fosters a culture of self-centeredness where individuals seek their own desires at the expense of communal well-being and the divine principles. They are always changing like sand shifting underneath your feet. Today, they want you to agree with their definitions of love and tolerance. And tomorrow, they'll want even more. If your hope is in the crowd's applause, you will eventually lose your soul trying to keep up. Dostoevsky once said, if you want to overcome the whole world, overcome yourself. Unquote. Start seeking the approval of the one who laid down his life for you and who told you the truth. Take a look at what's happened to those who have caught cave to the pressures. Celebrities and public figures who once stood for truth have been canceled, silenced, or shamed, not because they held to hateful ideas, but because they refused to abandon their ideas. They refused to abandon biblical principles. Christian business owners who stood by their faith and refused to bow to cultural demands have been dragged through courtrooms, lost their livelihoods, and been vilified in the media. They loved the approval of God more than the approval of man. And for that, the world hates them. But here's the reality. The approval of this world won't last no matter what you do. It will never satisfy. Isaiah 51 7 tells us, quote, Do not fear the reproach of mere mortals or be terrified by their insults. We used to say, Sticks and stones break my bones. Words will never hurt me. Now we put trigger warning and everything. We've really raised up. Mm. If you live your life for the acceptance of others, you will find yourself hollow and hopeless. But if you seek the approval of God, the creator of the universe, that is firm, unchanging, and eternal, then you will know. Stop seeking the fleeting approval of a world that will turn on you the moment that you stand for truth in opposition to them. And start seeking the approval of the one who laid down his life. So, now we know what not to place our hope in. I hope I've been very thorough. We've gone through the list of false hopes. They included money, fame, rituals, human approval. And seen, we've seen where each one leads. But what does the Scriptures tell us that the true source of hope and love actually is? Well, the answer is simple. And yet it is profound. Jesus. Romans 15, 13 says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I noticed we needed hope this morning, didn't we? It's God Himself who, will, who fills us with hope. Nothing else fills with hope. God fills with hope. Not the things of this world. Hope isn't something we muster up on our own. Hope is a gift. A precious gift born out of a relationship with Jesus. And what about love? Well, the Bible makes it crystal clear. 1 John 4, 8 says this, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Love isn't just something God does. It is what He 
is. The, the world will tell you that love is tolerance or love is acceptance without standards of any kind. But true love comes from God and true love never compromises. Ever. On anything. Love is strong. We, we traded old tough love for some sort of sentimental garbage. I don't even know what it... When you place your hope in Christ, you're not putting it in something temporary like wealth or public opinion. You're putting it in the eternal God who never changes, never fails, and never breaks His promises to us. Hebrews 6.19 tells us this, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. That's the hope we need, isn't it? That's the love we seek. It's the love I want. Not the fleeting approval of man. I could care less. Thank God. But the unshakable love of God that endures forever, every fiber of my being longs for that approval. So if you've been trusting in your own strength, the opinions of others or the world's empty promises, let me tell you this. There is a better way. Place your hope in the one who created you, formed you with his own hand, knows you by name, and loves you more than you can possibly imagine. His love is complete, and his love is eternal, and his hope is everlasting. No matter what happens next, no matter who is voted into the presidency, come on, guys. No matter what happens between Ukraine and Russia, no matter if we spend our money over there instead of there where we were supposed to, no matter how dark the evening sky becomes, the dawn of a new day approaches us. I feel it, don't you? A day that will no longer tolerate evil at all. A day when the tears of shame and sorrow are finally wiped clean by our Creator. A day when all fresh starts become an eternal reality in which God Himself throws your sin and your shame as far as the east is from the west. And I have it on good account, that's pretty far. But here's what you need to understand. While the kingdom of God is approaching us, those who have found our hope need to know that the satanic simulation keeps on running its twisted program. It keeps a record of the books, trust me. Story, uh, storing every detail of your life in digital and quantum configurations. It knows the places you go, the people you talk to, and the secret things you search for when you don't think anybody's looking. While God is a God of mercy who remembers your sins no more once they're forgiven, Satan, he doesn't operate that way. Satan does not forgive. Satan does not forget. He does not care about your second chances, your redemption. He does not care about your renewal. He loves to whisper lies. He loves to stir up shame and to remind you of every failure, every sin, and every great regret you've ever had in life and play them over and over and over again to you until you feel like you are going to die. The simulation is designed to hold you captive, to make you believe that your past defines you and that the world's judgment is final. And let me tell you, Satan loves to let you down. Every false hope, every promise of fulfillment outside of Christ, every fleeting pleasure you've ever had, it's just bait on the hook to drag you further and further away from the truth. But here's the good news. Satan's record keeping, his digital prison of shame and sin, has no power over the blood of Jesus Christ. The cross doesn't just delete your past, it obliterates it. The enemy can store up all the data he wants. I don't care. But once you are in Christ, that data becomes irrelevant. God doesn't just forgive. He redeems. He restores and He wipes the slate clean for all eternity. Instead, say yes to the one who sees you, knows you, and offers His love to those who believe in Him. I hate hearing it's unconditional. It's not. It's very conditional. You must believe in Him. Say yes to the hope that is anchored in Jesus Christ, the hope that is firm and secure, a hope that will never fail. While the world offers fleeting approval, Christ offers a love that is everlasting. But make no mistake, 
It comes with the condition of faith. John 3.16 reminds us this, and this is the one everybody knows but has forgotten the formula. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life." Unquote. Christ's love and salvation is available to all of us, but we must come to Him in first in faith that He might fill us with hope, trusting Him as Lord and Savior. It's not about earning His love through works or rituals, but by placing your faith in the One who has already made the ultimate sacrifice for you. Once you do that, the hope He gives is unshakable, unbreakable, and eternal. It is time to turn away from the false hopes and the false prophets of this world. Stop chasing the approval of people, you'll never get it anyway, the comforts of wealth, or the empty satisfaction of temporary pleasures. Remember, remember Neo's journey. I can't tell you how it will end. I can only show you the door. The choice is yours. Step through the door of Christ and embrace the everlasting hope that He offers. Those false hopes will always disappoint. Instead, run. Run to Jesus Christ who is the source of all truth and all hope and all love. He is the only one who can fill that void. And you know what I'm talking about that the world is left in your heart. He, Jesus, offers forgiveness. Where Satan offers shame, freedom. Where the world offers chains and eternal life. Where the world offers only death. Here is my hope. Here is the hope of all creation. This is the sustaining hope of the revelation of Jesus Christ. The dawn of a brand new day is approaching, a day when all evil will be banished, when every tear will be wiped away, and when death and pain will be no more. On that day, every false hope will be exposed, and only the truth of Jesus Christ will remain. The world system, its promises, and its idols will crumble before our eyes, but the kingdom of God will stand forever. So I challenge you today, place your hope in Jesus Christ and nothing less. Say no to the lies that are being told all around you and say yes to the only one who ever really cared for you at all. Because in the end, Christ is your only hope. Christ is King. Hail to the King.